Hello everyone, I am Jenna Denise Domingo, your discussant for this lesson. Today, we will be tackling about the meaning, nature, types, and theories of learning. But first, let us have our objectives. At the end of the lesson, students should be able to First, describe the nature of the learner and the learning process. Second, discuss the nature of learning. Let us look back through this course and discuss each word. Facilitating learner-centered teaching. What do we mean by facilitating or facilitators? They are the one who make a process or action easier. Learner is a person learning a subject or skill. Centered as the focal or a matter of being placed in the center. And then teaching, which is the process of attending to people's needs experiences and feelings and intervening so that students learn things and go beyond the given. So what do you think this course was for? This course is for us being both a student and a future educator. We'll be able to view perspectives from a student's perceptions as well as realize things that we could do when we start teaching. We'll learn from the best and I know that you can be the best of yourself too. We are all facilitators of our own learning. We are all responsible to ourselves. There will be times in our lives that with or without others' assistance, we must be able to stand on our own, make decisions, and be accountable to every action that we will make. In this course, before we move to the teaching phase, we will focus first on us being the one who was facilitated as learners. So, what are your thoughts about learning? The word learn Added with ing means it is a process. Learning is a key process in human behavior. All living is learning. According to Lardy Zabal, learning is integrated and an ongoing process. If we monitor the development of a child as it changes not only physically but also mentally from simple to complex behaviors, the difference that learning has made to the individual becomes very evident. Also, Ornstein says it is a reflective process. Why is that? It is because we constantly interact with and influence by the environment. The experience we gather or have makes us to change and modify our behavior to effectively deal with it. The learning occurs when we experience including the practice as the causes of relatively permanent change in an individual's knowledge, behavior, or potential behavior. As we develop the acquisition through maturation experience of new knowledge, skills, and attitudes made us to change. Then, there is that one word that could explain and prove one's learning. Can you guess? Correct! It is the word experience. Santok defines learning as a relative permanent influence or change in behavior, knowledge, thinking skills that comes through experience. With our own experiences, we learn. Learning is a long-term change in mental representations or associations as a result of experience as well. Now you see, learning is a change in behavior influenced by our previous behavior or experiences. Therefore, we could simply define learning as any relatively permanent change in behavior occurs as a result of practice and experience. And this definition has three important elements. First is where we change our behavior for better or worse. It is determined that learning occurs. In some reports, it states that any change in behavior of the learner can be deliberate of unintentional which proves this element next is a change that takes place through practice or experience but changes due to growth or maturation or not learning don't get confused there are some that grown but also did not learn in learning it requires to gather information to learn and reflect to such experiences and put it all into practice in short Growth of a person doesn't mean growth in learning as well. One must put effort to say he 
or she really have learned. Last, we should learn to change for a long time. There is no learning cure if the learning is temporary. The life we have could be temporary but this life requires to change permanently through such processes. And with that, the practice or the activities that involve either physical or mental. It could also be simple or complex, but in the end, these practices or activities could be referred to as types of learning. Motor learning. Motor learning is a form for one to maintain and go through daily life activities, as for walking, running, driving, climbing, and the like. These activities involve motor coordination. Motor learning is generally defined as a set of process aimed at learning and refining new skills by practicing them. Verbal learning. Verbal learning involves the use of spoken language as well as the communication devices used. Signs, pictures, symbols, words, figures, sounds are tools used in such activities. Verbal learning is also suitable for teaching and learning. Activities such as role-playing, simulations, interviews, group study, and etc. could also help to develop one's speaking skills. Concept learning Concept learning is a form of learning which requires the use of higher order mental processes like thinking, reasoning, and analyzing. It involves two processes, abstraction and generalization. Abstraction is the process of removing characteristics from something to reduce it to a set of essential characteristics where generalization is a form of abstraction whereby common properties of instances are formulated uh, as general concepts or claims. This type of learning is also known as category learning, a process by which experience allows us to partition objects in the world into classes for the purpose of generalization discrimination, and interference. Discrimination learning. This type of learning differentiates stimuli and reacting appropriately to this stimuli. An example is being able to distinguish the sound of horns of different vehicles like bus, car, and ambulance. It is literally the ability to classify, categorize, or differentiate. Learning of principles. Learning of principles is related to science, mathematics, grammar, and the like. Principles show the relationship between two or more concepts. Some examples of which are formulas, laws, associations, correlations, and the like. It is a type of learning which was used to manage one's work effectively. Problem solving. Problem solving is a higher order thinking process which requires the use of cognitive abilities such as thinking, reasoning, observation, imagination, and generalization. This is very practical and effective to overcome complicated situations that is encountered by individuals. Attitude learning. Attitude learning is a predisposition which determines and predicts behavior. Our learned attitudes influence one's behaviors toward people object things or ideas as well in life we develop different viewpoints from our childhood up until now about people objects and everything we know and the behavior may be positive or negative depending upon our attitudes and as future educators our attitude to our college teachers our students to parents and so much more are very important for uh, we must build relationship to understand one another than to squabble in this note, after we discuss the meaning and nature of learning, as well as the seven types, let us move to the theories of learning. Psychologists have attempted to explain how and why people learn which they led them to conduct numerous experiments on animals and children and have reached certain conclusive conclusions about the learning modes, which are referred to as learning theories. These explanations are frequently treated as forms of learning in numerous books, which in some ways are true. However, the term learning is extremely broad. It encompasses a diverse range of activities that cannot be adequately explained within a single framework. 
numerous theories exist to account for various modes of learning. First is the trial and error learning theory. This theory was developed by Edward Thorndike, who was an American psychologist. He argues that learning takes place through this method. According to him, learning is a gradual process where the individual will make many attempts to learn. The essence of this theory is, as the trials increases, the errors decrease. This is possible because of association formed between sense impressions and impulses to action. Such an association comes to be known as a bond or a connection because it is these bonds or connections which can be strengthened or weakened in making and breaking of habits. According to this theory, when an individual is placed in a new situation, he makes a number of random movements. Among them, those which are unsuccessful are eliminated, and the successful ones are fixed. These random movements are not eliminated at once. In the first attempt, their number is very large. In the second attempt, the number of errors diminishes, and the range of activity becomes narrower. Gradually, the individual learns to avoid unnecessary movements and reaches the goal. Improvement takes place through repetition. Thorndike studies the character of trial and error learning in a number of experiments on cats, using a box which he called puzzle box. In one of the experiments, a hungry cat was placed in the box and the door was closed which could be opened by pressing the latch or a latch. A fish was placed outside the box in a plate. The cat could see this fish on the plate. The cat was given 100 trials, 10 in the morning and 10 in each afternoon for 5 days. The cat was fed at the end of each experimental period and then was given nothing more to eat until after the next session. If succeeded in opening the door in and a trial by chance, the cat went to eat the food or the fish. A complete record was made of the cat's behavior during each trial. In the beginning, the cat made a number of random movements like biting, clawing, dashing, etc. Gradually, in subsequent trials, the cat reduced the incorrect responses or the errors as it was in a position to manipulate the latch as soon as it was put in the box. This experiment revealed that the random movements were decreased gradually, that is, as the trials increased, the errors decreased. As the trials increased, the solution to open the door by pressing the latch was discovered and at the end, the cat could open the door with zero error. The time taken in each trial was eventually reduced. Thorndike conducted many experiments with maze and puzzle box learning in which cats and rats were used. He has demonstrated that through numerous trials, the animals learns much and gradually improves his effort. We all learn many skills like swimming, cycling, riding, etc. through this method. Children learn to sit, stand, walk, and run by this method only. However, this method involves considerable waste of time and effort. And when we talk about the configurations of learning, we have six forms. Let us discuss the first two forms, which is learning by conditioning. In literal sense, conditioning means getting used to or adjusted to a new situation or a stimulus. It is a process of substituting the original stimulus by a new one and connecting the response with it. There are two types of conditioning theories, the classical and operant conditioning. Classical conditioning. This method of conditioning got its name from the fact that it is a kind of learning situation that existed in the early classical experiments of Ivan Pavlov, a Russian physiologist who was awarded Nobel Prize in 1904 for his experiments. Pavlov designed an apparatus to measure the quantity of saliva produced in response to food or meat power. At the beginning of his experiment, Pavlov noted that no saliva flowed when he rang the bell. 
He then trained the dog by sounding the bell and shortly afterwards presenting food. After the sound of the bell had been paired with food a few times, he tested the effects of the training by measuring the amount of saliva that flowed when he rang the bell and did not present food. He found that some saliva was produced in response to the sound of the bell alone. He then resumed the training paired presentation of bell and food a few times and then tested again with the bell alone. As the training continued, the amount of saliva on tests with the bell alone increased. Thus, after training the dog's mouth, watered salivated whenever the bell was sounded. This is what was learned. It is the conditioned response. This theory states that conditioned stimulus or the bell becomes a substitute after pairing with uh, unconditioned stimulus or the food and acquires the capacity to elicit a response. It is because the association or the conditioning is formed between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Let us have another example. Use of clapping three times as conditioned stimulus for the class to get quiet as a response. As neutral stimulus, let's clap three times. But the class usually will not get quiet as a response. Next is to instruct class to get quiet. Quiet down class as unconditioned stimulus. Then, the class will get quiet as unconditioned response. Let's try to pair it up by doing both the neutral and unconditioned stimulus. While clapping three times, instruct class to quiet. Quiet down class. Then, class will get quiet as a response. Therefore, as the conditioned stimulus, when we clap three times, the class will automatically quiet as a response to the action taken. No noise. That's how easy it is. But classical conditioning also has sub-principles which explain the different phenomena of this experiment. Extinction and spontaneous recovery. Extinction means cessation of a response. The use of the conditioned stimulus gradually decreases when it is presented alone and not followed by unconditioned stimulus for a number of trials. This process is called extinction in this experiment when only bell is presented without food for a number of trials, the dog stops salivation gradually. But when the conditioned stimulus, the bell, was paired again with the unconditioned stimulus, which is the food, for some trials, the conditioned uh, response is the salivation recovered. This is known as spontaneous recovery. In a spontaneous recovery, the dog required the less number of trials than the first time because the association between conditioned stimulus and conditioned stimulus still existed in the brain of the animal, which is also the same for humans and could be to our future students too. Stimulus generalization. It is a tendency to respond to a stimulus which is similar to original one. In short, the greater the similarity, the more the generalization. In this experiment, the dog started salivating even for the sound of a buzzer which was similar to a bell. Stimulus discrimination When there is much difference between two stimuli, the animal can discriminate between the two. For example, if the dog is conditioned to salivate at the signal of red light, it will not salivate when green light is presented. The same with the sound of the bell compared to the honk of the car. Higher order conditioning Here, a phenomenon where a light is presented followed by bell and then by food for a number of trials, the dog will start salivating the light itself. The dog learned and act with the sound of the bell. He learns what is going to happen and learns the exact response to the sound of the bell which is to salivate. All these principles are very useful in behavior therapy, but conditioning is not confined only to the laboratory. For in our day-to-day -day life, we come across many instances of such learning. For example, a small child who does not know touches a burning candle. It gives him a painful experience and withdraws his hand. 
Later, this experience will make him withdrawn from burning objects and avoid them all together. Conditioning is used as psychotherapeutic technique very effectively in the treatment of abnormal behaviors, such as phobias, alcoholism, and neurosis, etc. These are all called behavior modification techniques. Watson and others have conducted many experiments to prove the usefulness of this method. And another form of learning under conditioning is the operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is also called the theory of reinforcement. This method of conditioning was developed by an American psychologist, Bernhouse Frederick Skinner or B.F. Skinner. This theory is also known as instrumental conditioning because the animals use certain operations or actions as instruments to find solution. Skinner conducted his famous experiment by placing a hungry rat in a box called, after his name, Skinner Box. This box was containing a lever and a food tray in a corner of the box. It was so arranged that the animal was free to move inside the box, but the pressing of the lever would get the animal a pile of food in the tray as reinforcement. Arrangement was also made to record the number of pressings of the lever by mechanical device. It was found in the beginning that the rat pressed the lever occasionally and used to get food as reinforcement for each pressing. Gradually, as the animal learned the pressing of lever would give some food, it repeated the responses very rapidly. This rapid increase in pressing the lever is the indication of the animal condition to get food. In day-to-day -day life also, much learning takes place in animals as well as in human beings by this method. The reinforcement which will be, uh, will be the motivating factor. It will make the organism to repeat its action. Just like a child who was praised after cleaning his toys after use and gets a lollipop as a prize. Reinforcement. It is on the basis of these experiments, Skinner made his famous statement. Rewarded behavior is repeated. Instrumental conditioning involves more activity by the learner than classical conditioning. Skinner conducted his experiments on different animals like pigeons and rats and so on. Reinforcement, which is the most important aspect of this experiment, is divided into two types, the positive and negative. Positive reinforcement is used in reward training. It is the addition of pleasant things to increase the wanted behavior, such as an extra allowance after cleaning, playing mobile games after homework, and etc. And the negative reinforcement, like punishment, is used to stop undesired responses or behaviors. If the positive is addition, then the negative is removing the pleasant things to increase the wanted behavior. It usually occurs at home. Such techniques that only youngsters know, like cleaning the room to stop our mothers to nag us to clean it and many more. Operant conditioning is used in shaping undesirable behavior and also in modification of behavior. This is also useful in training of mentally retarded children to learn dressing, eating, and toilet training skills, treatment of phobias, drug and alcohol addictions, and psychotherapy, and to teach needed behavior in children. Further, these experiments have Prove that intermittent reinforcement yields better results than continuous reinforcements. Third form of learning is the learning by imitation. It is the simplest method of learning. Many of our daily activities are learned by imitating others. For example, the way we eat, drink, walk, talk, dress, etc. are all learned by imitating others. We observe and watch what and how other people do certain activities and imitate them. We observe the demonstrations given by an expert, imitate his movements and learn them. By copying the behavior of others, people avoid waste of time and effort of trial and error method of learning. For example, a child who saw his father 
throws the ball. Then the child will learn how to throw things and on the process, the same exact object could be thrown once he saw it, which is the ball. Psychologists like Miller and Dollard have tried to show that the tendency to imitate it is itself a learned response and if reinforced, the individual will be more likely to continue to imitate. Many people believe that imitation is a lower form type of learning. Still, others argue that imitation can never lead to a novel responses and there will be no chance to use individuals' creativity or originality. But at the same time, many educationists believe that only the imitative individual can learn better. Whatever may be the opinion, it is quite obvious that we learn many things by imitation. Next is the learning by insight. Many times, learning proceeds by the more efficient process of trying those methods which are seen to have a relation to solution. This is possible by understanding the perception of the situation. This theory was developed by a psychologist known as Wolfgang Kohler, who belonged to Gestalt School of Psychology. According to Gestalt theory, perception of a situation as a whole gives better understanding than some total of its parts. That is, the situation viewed as a whole will definitely look different from that viewed through its parts. Kohler conducted his most famous experiments on chimpanzee called Sultan. In the experiment, Sultan was put in a cage and a banana was placed at some distance outside the cage. Then, the chimpanzee was given two sticks, so constructed that one stick could be fitted into another and make the stick longer. The hungry Sultan first attempted with its hand to get the banana. Then, he took one of the sticks and tried to pull the banana nearer. Then, tried with other stick, but failed to reach it. By this effort, the chimpanzee became uh, tired and left the attempts to reach banana and started playing with sticks. While playing, so one of the sticks got fitted into the other and the stick became lengthier. Immediately, Sultan became elated and pulled the banana with his long stick and ate it. This sudden flash of idea to reach food with longer stick was called as insight by color. He conducted many experiments to prove that learning takes place also by insight and not only by trial and error. He conducted that the occurrences of insight to find solution to a problem is possible by perception of the whole situation. Kohler conducted many experiments on this line of learning to prove that just trial and error method is not enough to find solution for many complex problems. Trial and error or association through connectionism and conditioning may account for simple acquisition of knowledge, skills, interests, habits, and other personality characteristics, but it is absolutely insufficient for solving complex problems. And with that, this uh, method is very useful because it involves many higher mental processes such as thinking, reasoning, intelligence, etc. Insight occurs when the individual sees in a flash the solution to his problem or difficulty. It is not blind or stupid learning. It is an intelligent way of learning. In many occasions, people try to size up the situation, things and arrive at the conclusion. With experience, one is able to solve problems better and sooner. He exercises his discrimination ability in solving problems, and learning becomes a matter of insight rather than of trial and error. Then, we all know the fifth form, which is cognitive learning. This is where we use our mental skills. Then last is the verbal learning, where we use this language to communicate and learn through conversing or interaction. Moving on to the laws of learning. Thorndike has explained three laws of learning called primary laws. And in addition to this, he has also framed five subsidiary laws in connection with uh, 
has trial and error learning theory. Primary laws are the most important laws which explain the basic aspects of learning. They are law of readiness, law of exercise, and law of effect. Law of readiness. By readiness means the organism is ready to respond or act. This is more essential prerequisite for learning. This indicates that the animal or human being is motivated to learn. This condition of readiness has two effects, satisfaction and annoyance. When the animal is ready to act, if permitted, it gives pleasure. If it is not permitted, it feels annoyed. Having said this law, it could also be observed in a classroom which requires students' attention to learn to be satisfied. To help us understand this method, these points have been given below in the words of Thorndike. A. For a conduction unit ready to conduct to conduct is satisfying. B. For a conduction unit ready to conduct not to conduct is annoying. C. For a conduction unit not ready to conduct, to conduct is annoying. This law clearly shows that readiness of a person to learn is very important. Hence, motivate him to learn especially we are future educators. And that is why we must prepare them too as we make plans in organizing the lessons we will be discussing and on how we would engage them more. Law of Exercise this law is also known as law of frequency. Frequency refers to number of repetitions of learning. Thorndike believed that repeated exercising of a response strengthens its connection with stimulus. This aspect refers to law of use and disuse, which explains that anything not in use will perish. Also, if the uh, response is not repeated, its bond with stimulus gets weakened. This is also according to the statement that practice makes man perfect. In Thorndike's experiment, the cat becomes perfect after repeating the response uh, a greater number of times, like when it learned to open the door without committing any error. The Law of Effect This law states that when a connection is accomplished by satisfying effect, its strength is increased. By this, Thorndike meant that the probability of its occurrence is greater. In his experiment, if the hungry cat succeeded in opening the door, he would get its favorable dish to eat. This had a uh, positive effect on its response. Rewards always strengthen connections between stimuli and responses. And on the other hand, punishment weakens connections. And if we have primary laws, there are also secondary laws, which is the five subsidiary laws. Law of multiple response. It means when a response fails to elicit a desired effect, the learner will try with new responses until the goal is reached. Law of set or attitude. It is the mental set or positive attitude, uh, which is very important in any learning. Law of associative uh, shifting. This is nothing but shifting of the response to a new situation which is similar to the earlier one. Because the fundamental notion is that if a response can be kept intact through a series of changes in some uh, stimulating situation, it may finally be given to a new situation. Law of Prepotency of Elements This law states that the learner can react in a selected way, only to the salient elements of the problem and not for other unimportant elements. Law of response by analogy. It means comparing a new situation to the previously learned one and thus giving a response by analogy. As stated above, Thorndike formulated this loss based on his experiments. According to the law of readiness, the cat was ready to learn because it was hungry. This hunger motivated the cat to learn to open the door as well as the dog who needs to follow where the sound of the bell came from and learn what that means becomes a motivation. According to the secondary law, the cat was repeatedly given trials and exercise which strengthened its learning 
uh, which is the same to the dog. Finally, on each trial, the cat was given reinforcement in the form of fish, which is its food. This encouraged the cat to continue its effort to learn to open the door and the secondary laws given by him support these findings. These laws are highly relevant to the field of education. We, as teachers, can make use of these laws to make our teaching more effective. There are also phases of learning that could help us to develop ourselves and what we can do to learn more efficiently and effectively and put it into practice for a long-term basis. Unfreezing, ready to consider changes in knowledge, skills, and behavior. Unfreeze, to be prepared to absorb new skills and more. Problem diagnosis, looking for things that influence the changes. This phase is where we must know what the problem was to resolve it fast. Goal setting. The desired changes are identified. It is indeed important to have a goal in everything that we do in life to guide us and direct our own path. New behavior. Learning and practicing the new knowledge, skills, and behavior. After we unfreeze, identify the problem, and set the goal, it is where we will discover the new learnings and changes in our life, and that helps us to the last phase where we could apply it to our lives. The learnings that were put into practice and was exercise. The freezing. New learning is found beneficial and applied into the individual's ongoing knowledge, attitude, and behaviors. And in learning, we must also follow such principles for we are all learners for a lifetime. And with that, as learners, we must perceive the goal, be psychologically and physiologically ready, be motivated to learn, be active not passive for maximum learning, repeat or practice what we learn to remember, put together the parts of the task and perceive it as a meaningful whole, see the significance um, meanings, implications, and applications that will make a give experience understandable. Be prepared to respond. Be aware of own unique and specific ways of learning and solving problems. All these principles of learning which corresponds to the readiness, exercise, effect, primacy, recency, intensity, and freedom of each learner to decide and act on each own was given and to learn one must be willing to because if not even we are being thought we will never be able to learn even we undergo such processes for we are not serious we must be very into learning not because we have to but we want to learn and as future facilitators of learning we must know the conditions that facilitate the learning process for our students learning is facilitated in an atmosphere which encourages learners to be active, which promotes and facilitates the individual's discovery of the personal meaning of ideas, in which different ideas can be discussed but not necessarily accepted, which consistently recognizes the individual's right to make mistakes, in which evaluation is a cooperative process, and Last, learning is facilitated in an atmosphere when individuals feel they are respected and accepted. I guess you have already experienced some of this or it could be all of this which truly helps us to get motivated and engage more into learning. The facilitator is the teacher, the guide that assists us to learn but the environment where we supposedly learn must be fit as well. For it also contributes to the learning zone or area that facilitates the learnings we will have in the learning process. And if you are wondering how an individual could manage their own learning, well, here are some tips. Find a fixed place and time for study. And for now, our learning zone is our home. But we could also be specific like for example, our room in the terrace or sala in the morning, afternoon, or evening to be comfortable to learn. 
Also, we must remove the distractions like turning off our mobile phones notifications in order to focus. It may happen if we have time to read the prior materials or any other related topics to be discussed where we can use study tools like books, magazines, and even searching on nets is effective. And then, we should not pull all our time in studying. We must have breaks for our minds and body to have a rest time and avoid back pains, hungriness, and headaches. In this way, stress could be lessened too. All this must be put into practice. Make a drill if each step uh, in your management is effective, and if not, then change it. Wherever you are comfortable, do it. And last is to pray. Ask for the guidance of our Lord and Savior who provides strength and knowledge to us every day. Before I end this lesson, here is a reminder. We cannot teach another person directly. We can only facilitate his learning. States by Carl Rogers in 1961. Again, we are responsible for our own learning, but we could ask for assistance in the process. We could either be facilitated or facilitating on one's learning process. And that is all for today. I hope you learned something from me. Again, I am Jenna Denis Domingo, and thank you for listening. God bless.